Hey, welcome Belltown Church. All of our friends, for those of you joining for the first time, so glad to have you with us today. Want you to know that our church community, Belltown Church, we exist to create safe Jesus communities for the renewal of Belltown and beyond. We really just have a heart to create a safe space to find true and meaningful community, to find a safe space to explore Jesus, to grow in Jesus, to live out all that Jesus has called you to do. In addition to that, that he's called us to be a Jesus community, that we are a people, a gathered people that are all about Jesus. I'll tell you what, Almost every single time you gather with us, whether it is online or in person, hopefully sooner than later, we will preach about Jesus. We will talk about Jesus. We will teach about Jesus. We are madly and deeply in love with Jesus. We're all about Jesus. And we are, and not only that, but we are seeking the renewal of all things that is Belltown and beyond. That God's heart not only are for those who are far from Him to return to Him, but that the literal ground of the city would find healing and wholeness and that there would be restoration to businesses. There would be restoration to homes. There would be restoration to families. Severed relationships would find the shalom and the renewal of God. So, so glad you are tuning in with us today. This is our third week of a new teaching series that uh, we are in. And our teaching series that we are currently in is called Church. And the first two weeks, we dove head in. And we talked about the broken church. We've talked about how there is brokenness and trauma within the church. We've, uh, we, we have spearheaded and we've opened up the discussion to the reality of the brokenness within the church. Because we know this, if we really want to bring about the renewal of God in Belltown, we have to address the brokenness that was in the church and is still within the church. Today is week three, and on week three, we're going to, well, I'm going to be talking about uh, what is the church, really what the church is. And next week, or the next couple weeks, we're going to talk about the redemptive church. So we're starting in this place of being honest and vulnerable and speaking about the brokenness of the church. And we are moving into the heart of God for the church, God's vision for the church, God's mission for the church, and so on. But before I get ahead of myself... Today we're going to be talking about exactly what the church is. And I'll tell you what, we would have to be in a quarter, uh, a quarter long, um, several week course to really understand the fullness of the church. Excuse me. But I tell you what, we would have to be in several, we would have to spend several weeks discussing ecclesiology, the theology of the church, to really understand what the church is, really understand the fullness of church. But I only have several minutes with you. And so I just want to let you know up front that what I bring to you is kind of the overview of what the church is. And this teaching this sermon is really a is 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 to point us to the heart of God to what the church is but to also begin dialogue begin dialogue for exactly what the church is that we might 
uh, we might discuss what that church is in community and allow the Holy Spirit through our creative imagination and through the prophetic lens to be about, come on, his church here in Belltown. And so if you're taking notes at the top of your note-taking device, you can write down my title for today's teaching. I actually have two titles. It's up to you. You can write down both or you could just stick with one or the other. One or the other. It's not going to offend me. You could either write down Church 101 or Ecclesiology 101. If you don't know how to spell Ecclesiology, I suggest you go with the former title, Church 101. We're going to get started with the reading of God's Word to kind of frame where we are going to be headed today. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. If you've been around me for any amount of time, you will have heard me reference 1 Peter chapter 2 several times that this is such a foundational passage for those that follow Jesus. First Peter, Peter was a disciple and then eventually became the pastor of the first church after Jesus had uh, died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. Peter pastored this church in Jerusalem. And as days and years went by, the church had grown so significantly that, that the government of its day felt so threatened that they eventually started to uh, abuse and then martyr the church. That the, that the church was growing in such large numbers and such a, it was such an exponential growth that it started to threaten the government of its day. And so the government, out of fear and out of control, like every other government, turns to defend itself, to bend its own power by killing the marginalized, by, uh, by scrutinizing the marginalized. And so here, Peter writes to the Jerusalem church, a church that has gone through much martyrdom, much abuse, much persecution. And here Peter writes, 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to read verses 9 and 10. It says this, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result... You can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Verse 10. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Come on, would you pray with me for a moment? Holy Spirit, come rest in this place. I ask that you would do what only you can do. For every single person on the other side of the screen that is watching would hear your voice, would have ears to hear you, would have eyes to see you. I pray that hearts would be opened, the veil would be removed, that we might see Jesus today. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Today, again, we are talking about the church, what the church is. Now, before we talk about what the church is, I actually want to list out seven major myths about the church. I did a lot of research, and these are kind of the, the seven dominant myths about the church or what the church isn't. The first myth is this, church is a building that the four walls of a building is church. It's a myth. It's a myth. Number two, church happens one day a week. We go to church on Sunday. We go to church on 
Saturday or for the hipster churches we go to church on Wednesday or Thursday that church happens one day a week and this implies that if we go one day a week then we're good with God right but what happens to the rest of the week the six days out of the seven days of the week the third one is churches for good people churches for good people one of my favorite stories of pastoring is this old man who hadn't been to church in literally decades never stepped into a church building because he was just so fearful of God literally thought to himself that he would get struck by lightning or something like that some some terrible tragic act of God as he entered into a church building because he understood the premise that church is for good people it's a myth it's a myth it's not true number four church attendance will make me more like Jesus I will tell you what that is partially true but the honesty is this is that just because someone goes into the church does not make them more like Jesus just because I go into a barn does not make me a cow just because someone goes into the church does not make them more like Jesus number five church is a way of earning God's approval church is a way of earning God's approval I'll tell you what there is nothing that you and I can do to earn God's approval that we are saved and we are brought into flourishing of relationship with God through the person of Jesus and by Jesus alone and this is called grace Grace is the only thing that can make us approved. Number six, church is where we connect with God. Church is where we connect with God. And again, there's truth to that. But I will tell you what, if church is the only place a person can connect with God, they're in deep, deep trouble. Because a lot of the problems and a lot of the uh, tests and trials of resiliency of our faith is not in the walls of a church, but oftentimes it is outside the walls of a church or outside the, 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 um, the, the confines of a community of faith. And so, that's, again, this is a myth. Church is where we connect with God. Yes, we can connect with God with ch at church. Man, there's nothing like singing and worshiping and going after the presence of God with people in person. Cannot wait to do that with y'all. But Jesus often withdrew to be with the Father by himself. And he's inviting you and I to the same faith the same way that you and I can often withdraw to be with the Father. And we don't have to do it in a church. Number seven, and finally, seventh myth is that church is optional for Jesus' people. Woo! Pushing on some of y'all's button. Church is optional for Jesus' people. I'll tell you what. The modern day, postmodern mindset, the postmodern uh, ideologies have painted that if we just do our own, uh, do our own life, and we figure, and we're we're good citizens, and we stay out of people's way, and we don't cause harm, then we are a benefit to society. And so this has perpetuated a life of isolation. And the kingdom of God is anything but isolation. The moment that you and I enter into the kingdom of God, we are brought into community. We're not saved into isolation. We're saved out of isolation because sin wants to isolate us. The devil wants to isolate us. Man, I'm preaching right now. I feel this. But God is calling for you and I to counter this very myth that we would be about the things of God, which include being a part of communities of faith, attending church, going to church, doing your part, advancing the church, growing the church, doing whatever it is, and that we would give him our yes to church because church is not optional for Jesus' people. Now, those are just some of the myths, you know, those are some of the myths there. And, and one of the great hypocrisies, one of the great hypocrisies within the broken church 
is this, is that passivity has been married to just judgmentalism. One of the great hypocrisies within the, the broken church is that passivity is married to judgmentalism. As significant, as, 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 as significant trauma and fractures have taken place within the church, there have been both passivity and judgmentalism from both sides. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because as these myths are perpetuated within the church, throughout church history, all of a sudden, it doesn't bring us together, but it actually divides us even more. And what that does is it draws a line in the sand to where now, as people, we have to pick a side. Are we going to be on the conservative side? Are we going to be on the liberal side? Are we going to be on the pro-Trump side? Are we going to be on the anti-Trump side? Are we going to be the, the pro-Biden side? Are we going to be on the anti-Biden side? And then once we go on in, into our rep respective groups, then we start to formalize theologies around those things. And friends, this is what we have created church to be as of late. We draw a line in the sand and say, pick a side create some theologies around it, start fighting. This is what the this is what the church has been created to be as of late. If this is the list that has been believed by literally majority of the church in America, and this is what it feels like to follow after God, then we have to ask this question, what exactly does the Bible say about the church? Because of those things are myths and they are not true. They do not align with God's heart and they are not found in the scriptures. Then we have to ask the question. It's almost like we have to hit the restart button. We have to go back to level one and we have to ask and search the scriptures. What exactly does the Bible say about the church? Well, first thing to point out is this, is that our English word church derives from the original language of the Bible, Koine Greek, and we translate our English word church from the Koine Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia. Now, ekklesia is mentioned 148 times throughout the Bible. That's a significant amount of times. I mean, the Bible is, you know, is, is way more than 148 words. But when something is mentioned that often, it's almost as if God is trying to get our attention to it. And so Ecclesia is mentioned 148 times throughout the Bible. But what's important is there are far more references to church all throughout the Bible, outside of this word, ecclesia. For instance, let me give you, let me give you some examples. There's, there's biblical imagery for church in addition to this word, ecclesia. Let me give you some examples. The biblical imagery, there's, let's start with this one. The imagery of the house of God. Ephesians 2.20 says, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. So the church, in a, the church is the house of God. And so all throughout the Bible, there are, there, there are imageries used to, uh, to, to point, to draw us to the house of God. Another imagery is the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, All of you together are Christ's body. And each of you, each of you, not some of you, not the ones that are the richest or the ones that are the poorest, not the ones that are biblical, biblically literate or the, those who are biblically illiterate. It's each of you, all of you are a part of it. But there is, there is so much imagery throughout 
the New Testament that draws us to the body of Christ. This is the imagery of the church as the body of Christ. I mean, the bride of Christ, excuse me. 2 Corinthians eleven twelve. 12, I love this passage. It says, for I am jealous. This is Paul the Apostle talking to the Corinthians. For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. Then there's the imagery of the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now this is this goes all the way back to the Old Testament. This is so prophetic in its nature. But here in Ephesians 2, 21, it says, We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple. Do you see it? Becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Now here's a couple more obscure images for the church used in the Bible. First is the imagery of the lampstand. Revelation 1.20 Revelation 1.20 says, The seven stars are the angels of seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And finally, now this is just, there, there's, there's significant more imagery found in the Bible, but I'll end on this one for, this, for time's sake. The imagery of the flavor of God's kingdom. I just had to throw that in. Flavor, flavor, right? The imagery of the flavor of God's kingdom. Matthew 5, 13 says, You are the salt of the earth. Now, what's very interesting is if you and I were to grow up in ancient Hebrew culture, that as we were to hear the scriptures read, or as we were to ourselves read the scriptures, that we wouldn't just read that and intellectually store it. No, the ancient Hebrews were a, in, were a very visual people, an extremely visual people. So as something was read, they would always associate what they were hearing to an image. That's why there's so much imagery all throughout the Bible. And so the ancient Hebrews, they often read the scriptures until they could see an image in their mind's eye, in their spirit. And once they saw an image, they would meditate on it. Once they saw an image, once an image was impressed within their soul, they would pause and they would meditate. And so with those biblical images that I just read to you, the house of God is your soul found in the safety and presence of our Heavenly Father. Come on, meditate on that. Is your soul found in the safety and presence of our Heavenly Father? The meditating on the body of Christ. Are you living as an imitator of Christ Jesus to the to those in your world? The imagery of the bride of Christ. Are you growing in an intimacy with Jesus, the lover of your soul? The imagery of the temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you living in ways of the Spirit? Or are you living according to the ways of the world? Are you living in the ways of the Spirit? Or are you living according to the ways of this world? The imagery of the lampstand. Do you burn for the person and ways of Jesus? Do you burn for more of God? Do you hunger and thirst for more of God? Is the soul of your lampstand lit for God to come and dwell with you? And the flavor, I mean, the imagery of the flavor of God's kingdom is your life adding goodness and beauty and kingdom potency in others' lives. Is your life adding goodness and beauty and kingdom potency 
in others' lives. Now, these are powerful images throughout the scriptures that help point us to what church is. But I want to go back to this word, ecclesia. Again, ecclesia is this Koine Greek word that we translate into our English word, church. But the word church is found 148 times in the Bible that is directly linked to ecclesia. Ecclesia means, when you break down the meaning of the Koine Greek, it is, it is best translated as an assembly of people to gather around news, ideas, philosophies, and so on. There's a story, I believe it's in Acts 19 or somewhere around that, where the Apostle Paul, he goes into, he goes into, into Rome and, uh, and, and he goes into, uh, and he finds these peoples that are these wise peoples, these philosophers, and they're arguing about news and ideas and whatever. And that in and of itself is an ecclesia. That there are these philosophers and poets and and, and, and and cultural prophets that are gathered in this little assembly discussing and debating ideas of the day. Now the church is much more than that. The church is a community of faith made up of unique and diverse individuals gathered around good news and the felt presence of Jesus. I'm going to say that again. The church is a community of faith made up of unique and diverse individuals gathered around good news and felt presence of Jesus. But as I was studying and preparing this way for this teaching, and I was studying this word ecclesia, there was just so much more depth to it. The scholars, they lead into this, the, 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 they invite the readers into this one word, ecclesia. That's why I love the Bible. That's why I love following after Jesus because the, we, could, we could spend a lifetime on one passage really dissecting, allowing it, uh, allowing it to have its way in our souls. And, uh, and we could intellectually understand the, the, the fullness of it. And so Ecclesia has even more depth than that definition of the church that I just gave. Now in light of the church, here is the most profound, profound and prophetic energies behind this word, ecclesia. And it is this, is that ecclesia is specific for a community of faith that would be called out and called into. That ecclesia exists within a community of faith, within an assembly of people, within an individual's heart to be called out of and called in to. Again, ecclesia is a community of faith that is called out of and called in to. What in your life has the Holy Spirit called you out of and called you into? What in your life has the Holy Spirit set you free from and set you free into? Are you seeing this now? That there is power to this word that we translate as church. There is power to the word ecclesia. That ecclesia doesn't just refer to this idea of church, but that there is power to it that wants to bring us out of captivity, out of brokenness, out of trauma, out of sin, and lead us and call us into healing, call us into shalom, call us into freedom and, and joy and peace and the things of God. The ecclesia of God is, is more than a gathering place 
for mental warfare puffed up ideologies and profound theologies. The ecclesia of God is where the miraculous takes place. Therefore, the church after God's heart is a place for the miraculous. You see people come out of addiction and they come into relationship with Jesus. They are now the church of God. People come out of abuse and trauma and come into safety and the mercy of Jesus. They are now the ecclesia of God. I love our teaching text that I read in the beginning for it includes more descriptions of church while also accurately pointing to the supernatural essence, the supernatural energies behind ecclesia, hidden within this word ecclesia. First Peter chapter two, verse nine, it says, for you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Do you see it? This is the supernatural, uh, this is the supernatural powers of Ecclesia. Once you were not a people, but now you are are the people of God. Once you ha had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying today through the scriptures. Ecclesia is the promise of God and the prophetic way of the kingdom that results with the Holy Spirit calling you and I out and calling humanity in. Ecclesia is this invitation out of and into. This is why church is so important. That church is this assembled community of faith made up of unique and diverse individuals. For the glory and the mission of Jesus, but friends, the church has missed out on the beauty and the power of Ecclesia. And the ecclesia is to be a place of the supernatural. That ecclesia is to be a place where people can come into one way and leave another way. That ecclesia is this journey where we follow after Jesus and we are continually being let out of and brought into. I love this. We weren't a chosen people, but now we are called into a chosen people. You and I weren't a royal priesthood, but now in Jesus, we are a royal priesthood. Come on, apart from Jesus, we are far from being a holy nation and God's beloved people. But now in Jesus, we are called into a holy nation and God's beloved in verse 10, it speaks to the good news of Ecclesia. For it says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If we want to be the Ecclesia, that is after the heart of God, we will have to allow the Spirit of God to do his intended ecclesia work within us. Have you been resisting the Holy Spirit today? Have you been resisting the Holy Spirit calling you out? I want to let you know that the Holy Spirit is pure hearted toward you. That the Holy Spirit has no malice has no anger, has no ill intent towards you. If the Holy Spirit wants to call you out, and the world in this day wants nothing to do with being called out, but the Holy Spirit is about calling us out so that we can be called into. Friends, this is the heart of God. This is the good news. 
That the Holy Spirit just doesn't just call us out and leave us naked and ashamed in our brokenness after being called out. No, the Holy Spirit calls us out so that we might be clothed in Christ and healed through Christ and brought into the supernatural energies of Ecclesia. That once we were not and when in Jesus, we can be. Have you been complacent? And living into the fullness of what God has called you into. Because friends, Ecclesia is both and. That God is calling you out and he is calling you into. But have you been complacent living into the promises of God? Have you been living, have you been complacent living into your calling? Have you been complacent in loving your enemy? Have you been complacent in giving away what you don't deserve? Have you been complacent today? Have you been complacent in this season? I believe that the church that I believe that God is inviting us into is much more than just an assembled people coming together just to do religious, religious duties. No, 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 no. I believe that God is inviting us to a heart, I mean to a church that is near to his heart, that we would not just assemble, but that we would, we would assemble with the ecclesia, supernatural energies, that we would create a safe space where people can come and they can know Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to call them out so that they can be called into. Man, if we really want renewal in the city, we're going to have to create a safe space to where the Holy Spirit can use us to be an ecclesia here in Belltown and beyond to call out this city so that we can call them into renewal. Have you been complacent today? Allow the Holy Spirit to search your hearts. Where have you hardened your heart toward the ways of Ecclesia? The Holy Spirit wants to call you out. Allow him to call you out today. But know this, that the Holy Spirit doesn't want to just call you out, but he wants to call you into the promises of God. For all of the promises of God, they are yes and amen.